Hello and welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Terry and I'm your host Terry Cato. January is National Human Trafficking Month and I'm excited to have here sitting with me Miss Vanessa Russell, an advocate for human trafficking here in the Bay Area. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. We're going to be here. Thank you so much. We're going to just jump right in and because I'm so excited to get the information out there to viewers about what's going on in the Bay Area and in the United States. And if you could just start off, first of all, with um, just introducing yourself. Sure. Um, so my name is Vanessa Russell. I um, have uh, uh, been running an organization called Love Never Fails for the last six years. Mm -hmm. um, we were founded uh, right out of the Bay Area in Alameda County in San Leandro, actually. Uh, I was teaching young people dance mm -hmm. and uh, for about 14 years, and one of my 15-year-olds uh, was unfortunately was assaulted in Hayward and then uh, was sold throughout mm -hmm. California for over a year. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, 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 we don't have enough time to go into my background, but um, I come from a background of poverty. I was in foster care. I experienced a great deal of abuse. And so I was very familiar with what was going on in the streets. Mm -hmm. But um, when I went to look for my 15-year-old dance student and I realized that um, she was sold and, and that there were people that were willing to buy her wow. at such a, uh, it had become such a common thing and, wow. and that there were many other children that were out there that were buying her. I was just dumbfounded because uh, I guess for me as I was growing up I had always thought even though again I came from poverty was in, in very much aware of what was going on I had always thought that this was just something that had happened to adult women that were you know kind of maybe chose that life right. and um, and I, of course that perception about choosing that life has really been altered um, as I've be educated myself and become more aware of what's happening to our children Absolutely. and what's happening to our adults and um, really the horrific experiences that they're having while they're being so sold, mm -hmm. modern day slavery, sold Absolutely. in our community in broad daylight. Wow, that's amazing. And how did you come up with the name Love Never Fails Us? I really like that. How yeah. did you come up with that name? Yeah, so um, you know, so I, I currently work and have been throughout this time working full time at Cisco Systems. Okay. Um, I was a uh, single mom at the time, mm -hmm. two children, um, and as this um, this situation came up with my student, I was just kind of at a loss as to how I was going to continue to serve the youth that I was already serving mm -hmm. uh, in dance. I was teaching them dance and then work full time and take care of two children on my own mm -hmm. and uh, help this young lady and other people that were being trafficked. And um, I began to pray. And um, what came to me was that all I, all I needed to do was to love. Uh, love was the the only thing that I was required to do, and that everything else would be taken care of, and and uh, and so I uh, that was when love never fails was you know the name was birthed then just knowing that uh, I could not fail mm -hmm. if I would just bring love to awesome. the table. That's great. That's beautiful. And you threw out um, a statistic, which is, um, and I have quite a few statistics here, but the one that stuck out to me was, it just says globally, the average cost of a slave is $90. Yes. Just yeah. $90. Yes. And I just want you to talk more about, um, you know, just how, how does that look in the Bay Area? I know we have a problem in a lot of the major cities, mm -hmm. um, Phoenix, Miami, Atlanta. So it's not just here in the Bay Area, but it's in a lot of our major cities. We have a, a human trafficking problem. Um, what does it look like here in the Bay Area? Like, how do these young people end up in situations like that? Yeah, so um, when, when you hear that stat of the average cost, really what that's referring to is the opportunity to basically purchase someone for sex mm -hmm. for, you know, it could be 15 minutes, it could be an hour, um, and the cost being somewhere around $90. Mm -hmm. And that cost uh, varies depending on what um, uh, someone would be required to do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sounds, it, it probably makes your stomach turn, but there are um, there are all kinds of acronyms that you'll find online, and a lot of this this business is being transacted online uh, in, in, a, in a public uh, website wow. um, where people uh, list 
the kind of things that they would be willing to do. Uh, you know, I kiss, I don't kiss. You know, I, I touch here, I don't touch there. I use condoms, I don't use condoms. Mm -hmm. And all of those things um, determine what the, what the price will be for mm -hmm. a person that's being sold. Mm -hmm. uh, now remember that many of the people have no choice as to whether they'll be able to use a condom or not. And if the price of doing, it, doing something like that without a condom is high enough, um, a child is being subjected to communicable diseases, venereal diseases, um, uh, never mind the mental trauma, uh, the psychological trauma, the emotional trauma that they're enduring. So, um, and, and an adult for that matter, because adults can also be forced mm -hmm. to do this. What does it look like? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it looks like a variety of things. It looks like going on to uh, Craigslist, going on to, you know, Backpage, these different pages and, and quote unquote looking for a date and mm -hmm. um, making uh, contact with someone via Snapchat, via, uh, via email, via text, mm -hmm. and um, having a conversation about where they're going to meet. They may meet in a car, they may meet in a, in a, on the street, in the back of a restaurant, they may meet in a, in a hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it happens in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't just happen in the usual places that you might think, like an urban town. Um, mm -hmm. There was a very major, large case that that was just uh, um, processed um, right out of Danville. Mm -hmm. um, there's cases that are coming out of San Ramon, out of Castro Valley, mm -hmm. uh, out of very affluent neighborhoods wow. um, where brothels are actually hosted right there in the middle of the neighborhood, unbeknownst to um, to uh, uh, to all of us. And then, of course, uh, the National Human Trafficking Hotline, Polaris published a story uh, just a couple of weeks ago on, I believe it was 9,000 massage parlors that were hosting trafficking uh, rings wow. uh, throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. So this looks and feels a lot of different ways right. and can be transacted in a lot of different mm -hmm. ways, but at the end of the day, there is a human being that has lost their liberty, lost their rights, and has right. been objectified and, and enslaved, mm -hmm. and um, obviously it's just not okay. No, it's not okay. And and you just you brought up some very interesting points because I don't think the general public or myself when we think of human sex trafficking, quite honestly, I'm probably ignorant to a lot of what happens because I still think of sex trafficking as um, okay, a woman on a, a woman um, walking up and down the street, yes, kind of selling mm -hmm. herself. I never think about the brothels that happen, you know, in houses, like you said, in affluent neighborhoods. We had a big bus when I lived in Phoenix. I yes. remember that yes. in a very nice neighborhood. And I never think about the massage parlors. Right. parlors. Where I live, um, that's something that the neighbors we complain about a lot is that okay, what's up with all of these parlors that are opening up and down this street? Right. So that are staying open until two o'clock in the morning exactly what you a know massage. legitimate massage parlor does that thank you so my question is this as far as law enforcement is concerned is this just almost a losing battle for them how are they combating this because yeah. I mean it just seems like um, it's almost getting away from them how are they yeah, so the laws have been improved uh, tremendously uh, in the last couple of years. I think back to about five years ago, Prop 35 was on the ballot. It passed at the highest rate that any proposition had been passed, mm -hmm. and it required that um, we increase the laws in times past. Before that, someone who was exploiting a, a victim would only receive like a, almost like a traffic ticket, wow. have to go to a Saturday school and pay a $500 fine. Can you imagine no, raping I... a child and having to pay a $500 fine? No. Now they're facing 25 years to life okay. for exploiting a, a, a child uh, and a 1.5 or I think it's 1.5 million dollar fine. Okay. So that's a great thing. Yes. However, um, I think that uh, the law enforcement is really challenged in that you have to get witnesses to come forth yes. and witnesses who are scared, who are traumatized mm -hmm. and witnesses that may not have housing and stability to pull from. Uh, it's really hard to be a witness for uh, against an exploiter when you're living in the same neighborhood where they know how to get at you. Mm -hmm. They know how to get at your family. And so you're really in a lot of uh, in harm's way mm -hmm. unless you can be relocated in a very short order um, and um, also psychologically and emotionally stabilized. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have two houses for women and children and we've we've been asked to support some of the women as they give testimony uh, against exploiters and many of them back out because mm -hmm. it's just too stressful for them. Right. They've already 
already been traumatized. And so, so, um, and it's nothing that law enforcement is doing wrong or anything like that. It's just the dynamic of the situation. Um, it, it's, it's, it's extremely traumatic. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the exploiters know this. Mm -hmm. And so this is why they prey on children. Yes. This is why they prey on people mm -hmm. because they can sell a person, unlike drugs, over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they count on and they bet on the fact that the level of trauma that they uh, uh, put a person through will keep them from testifying against wow. them. Wow, amazing. This is amazing. It's amazing. It's mind boggling, it's discouraging, it's disheartening. Um, so with that, we're gonna, we're gonna talk just a, a little bit more. We're gonna talk more about um, solutions and things that you guys and other organizations are doing after the break. But for right now, I just wanna throw out there, what kind of responsibility do you feel like some of these platforms have that allow this kind of stuff to go on? Like, I mean, like you said, Craigslist and some of these other backroom um, websites or whatever, do you feel like they bear some of the burden because they're actually the conduit? Yeah. The, they bring the parties together. Do you feel like they should be doing more to crack down on what's going on? Yeah, I do. And actually, there was some legislation that was just um, rewritten, interestingly, um, that would have held, held um, the platforms accountable mm -hmm. for facilitating some of these communications. I will tell you that the um, big tech IT companies are against that kind of legislation because it would require an, a tremendous amount of expense mm -hmm. to determine who's using their platform for ill intent. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a challenge because on one hand, they want to facilitate communication. Mm -hmm. They want to facilitate relationships. Uh, on another hand, um, we, we want them to um, kind of police the platform a bit. And, um, and so there's this, this constant discussion about what, what part is the responsibility of the user versus the platform provider. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see platform providers come together and support organizations such as ours right. um, more sort of directly so because we can inform them uh, if they if they would engage for example I, I uh, we, we do search and rescue so mm -hmm. when children are missing um, we look for children online and on the in the streets and we do uh, flyering and a variety of other things if we were consulted uh, we would be able to say oh, look at this place and look at that mm -hmm. place this person clearly is being sold that person's clearly being sold mm -hmm. Um, the National uh, Missing Children, Missing and Exploited Children's uh, 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 Organization, uh, they have a cybersecurity uh, division that will allow people to report when we think a child is being sold online. Nice. And so, and they work very closely with a nonprofit called Thorn, mm -hmm. which actually Ashton Kutcher is part of, and, mm -hmm. and they're doing some great work. They are. But, um, you know, the, the question is, um, can we get more? Mm -hmm. Can we get more of these high-tech companies to realize that they're um, they're well-meaning? I'm not blaming them, Absolutely. but let's partner together mm -hmm. to um, solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. So this is great information. I'm just um, I'm just kind of almost at a loss for words, which mm. is very unusual <laughs> for me. <laughs> but we are going to take a break. Welcome back to Real Talk with Terry, and we're just gonna keep the conversation going. So, Vanessa, yes. okay, we talked um, some statistics um, before the break, and we just talked about um, what is human sex trafficking looks like in the Bay Area and just anywhere in any major city or like you brought up. Sometimes it happens in small cities or in very affluent communities. So now I wanna talk more solutions what can we do as citizens to yeah. just make our communities more safer for our children and ourselves so first of all if you could just tell us or tell me a little bit more about what you guys do what you specifically do in the community and how you're helping victims overcome their trauma absolutely so the one um, thing that I think uh, we can kind of rally around is ensuring that children are aware of the tactics that will be used 
to recruit them into okay. human trafficking. Mm. These are tactics that are used online or used in malls or used as they're walking home from school, mm. used as, you know, as they're using some of our social media, the Facebook, the, the Twitter, the Snapchat, the Omegle, the, the different apps that are out there. And there's quite a few mm. that are, you know, now there's so many apps that are out there and parents really need to become aware mm. of how some of these apps work. Some of them work, um, they allow you to do blind dating with, with someone and it starts out as a joke and but it becomes an enticing thing for a vulnerable child right. um, and a, a way for an adult to make you know make contact with a child that um, that doesn't know uh, their that what they you know their ill intent mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we have formed a collaborative with an organization uh, or with a, a group of organizations uh, uh, three strands global okay. and Frederick Douglass family initiative and and that is called protect mm -hmm. and that stands for prevention organized to educate children on trafficking mm -hmm. and we've taken time to sit with the California Department of Education and also the Office of the Attorney General in California so they've vetted all of our content and we're currently in 17 counties doing prevention education teaching the teachers mm -hmm. how to educate the students in 5th, 7th, 9th, and 11th grade okay. about those tactics. Okay. And so we urge you to, uh, uh, you know, the parents who are listening, advocate with your PTA and with your schools to get protect into the schools now. Uh, you know, th there's not a moment to waste. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, I can give you that information later on how you can get plugged in on that. Protectnow.org is okay. the website. So that's a good place to start. Also, if someone is just um, a, notices something that doesn't look right. You know, mm -hmm. I, I remember hearing a story of a woman who had noticed that um, a, a, the only time they saw a woman come out of her home was once a week to roll out the garbage on the curb. And it mm -hmm. looked odd to her. Mm -hmm. Never came out to do groceries, never came out to walk a dog, never came out to greet a friend. And so she called in to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, mm -hmm. and that number is 888 Three seven three seven eight eight eight, and so or you can text be free mm -hmm. either one and so she contacted them they looked into the matter and she was being human trafficked wow. and that was right in the city of San Jose oh, wow. and so these um, you know she was being made to uh, take care of the children clean the home mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes that goes hand in hand with being a sex slave to the owner as well mm -hmm. and um, and so these these are the situations that we're encouraged to just notice right. notice okay. that you know what sometimes we drive down the street and we see a young child that's out at 11 and 12 o'clock at mm -hmm. night on the corner mm -hmm. they're probably not there just to hang out with friends okay. uh, it's okay you call up the number mm -hmm. worst case scenario it was a false alarm okay. um, but that's a good thing to start with okay so that's a good thing to start with is mm -hmm. to just be aware yes if it doesn't look right say something say something do something yes. call the number text the number yes. and just report it. Because, That's right. Like you said, you brought up a good point. What's the worst that could happen? It's just a false alarm. But right. I mean you may have saved the child if you it may. is. That's right. So um so then the other thing is um I know you guys have a very exciting program yes. that you recently launched. Yes. Could you just tell us about the partnership that you have and how you're helping victims, you know, just on their road to recovery and becoming independent citizens again. Yes. So one of the things that uh, we're very committed to doing as we launched our housing program mm -hmm. we became aware that um, uh, the women in our program really needed to uh, get to work start yes. you know workforce development and mm -hmm. so we started helping them with resume writing mm -hmm. and interviewing techniques and we opened a community store in Hayward uh, the Love Never Fails community store where we sell secondhand clothing and we employ survivors nice. and we thought that's a great start mm -hmm. but then we started uh, realizing you know that's really not going to provide them the sustainable income that they need mm -hmm. and so we started into some partnerships with Wells Fargo mm -hmm. getting them into the banking industry mm -hmm. with Century 21 getting them into real estate one of our ladies just passed the real estate test awesome. two of our ladies just finished a banking classes and now they're you know uh, uh, applying for bank jobs as bank tellers and that was awesome too and but what we realize is technology is really uh, making a huge difference creating sustainable careers uh, not just for human trafficking survivors but for those in re-entry for that are high risk for being involved 
in human trafficking, either as exploiters or as uh, exploited. Uh, those that are in foster care, mm -hmm. teenage parents, homeless, mm -hmm. impoverished, anyone who's vulnerable mm -hmm. is at risk for trafficking. Okay. And our uh, mission is to work with uh, those who are at risk and currently being mm -hmm. uh, uh, trafficked. And so we implemented a program that is called IT Biz, okay. and that is going to provide a Cisco certification to the students that are enrolled in our nice. class. And nice. we're talking about in, you know, going from being exploited on the street to making $50,000 a year with That's that certification. Amazing. That's awesome. We're just amazing. That's amazing. That's so exciting and it's very encouraging, but how do we get the victims to this point? So, for example, if, if you yourself or if someone you know is being trafficked or being put out there, how would you suggest they break free or, or what should they do? I mean... Yeah, so, so we encourage people who are currently being victimized mm -hmm. to contact the National Human Trafficking Hotline, okay. um, which again is 888-3737-888, mm -hmm. okay. call that number. Um, and they are able to respond, send police to your aid. Okay. Um, we also um, encourage you to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a team, uh, albeit it's not law enforcement, but we have a team of people that are very committed to getting the attention of the proper folks, Absolutely. advocating. Yes. Um, and so you could reach out to us and uh, and you, you can reach out to me specifically at Vanessa at loveneverfailsus.com and say, mm -hmm. I want out. Mm -hmm. I need your help. I need your suggestions. And we will do whatever we can to advocate for you to get the help that you need. There is a very important component, which is housing. Yes. Housing, housing is such a huge component. And we currently have two houses, one in Alameda County, one in Sacramento County. Mm -hmm. We partner with other agencies that have houses. Um, uh, you know, there's one in Atlanta that is just amazing that mm -hmm. we work with. Uh, we work with Breaking the Chains in Fresno. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with Crossing the Jordan in Santa Rosa. Nice. Uh, City Team Ministry that provides housing mm -hmm. uh, here in, Sac in San Jose. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of uh, community solutions uh, down here in San Jose as well. And so there's just a variety of folks that we can go to. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's such a limitation of beds. Mm -hmm. It's it, it, I want to say that um, throughout the nation, uh, there's probably less than 2,000 beds available. Wow. And just to put that in context, mm -hmm. we do street outreach, mm -hmm. and we, in one year, we met 306 exploited wow. people just by doing street outreach mm -hmm. three hours every month. Wow. So if I can meet 306 people needing a bed mm -hmm. in Northern California, right. And uh, then, and, and there's only two thousand beds available right. nationwide. Wow. So that's the need. Yes. So that's a real need. So yeah. that's kind of a call to action, so to speak, is that we need more people advocating and opening up homes so that they yes. can actually take the victims off the street. So that's a real need. Yes. And a call to action is that that's we right. need the homes open. We need and and is are there resources for people who might say, "Hey, I can do that." So Yeah how do they get started like what can they do maybe give them just a couple of pointers on if you if this tugs on your heart where you want to help this cause or you want to help get victims off the street so what should they do if they wanted to offer a place or yeah. offer up something so recently we've been getting a lot of requests because we've, we've done housing now for for three years mm -hmm. and we've provided housing for 87 women and 15 awesome. children and so we've been getting a lot of requests to train people to actually open up their own homes. Right. So we've established a consultancy. Okay. Um, and so again, reach out to me. Uh, okay. If you have a heart to open up your own house, but you don't know how, mm -hmm. um, there, it, it, your house has to be trauma informed. Mm -hmm. It has to have certain safety parameters. Right. Your staff needs to be trained at a certain level. Um, and we would be happy to help mm -hmm. um, with that 
process. Awesome. awesome. That's great. That's great because I do feel like the more we create awareness that there will be more people who feel like, you know what, this is where I want to kind of plant myself and I want to help bring people to safety and get people out of the cycle of being victimized. Yep. And um, if you could just highlight some of those who are most vulnerable, vulnerable mm -hmm. in the community so that again, people can kind of be aware of what to look for. And then I'm going to close by just throwing out a few statistics that just blew my mind in mm -hmm. terms of um, human sex trafficking. Yeah, I would say the most vulnerable, clearly children, because mm -hmm. of their developmental, um, you know, natural developmental uh, challenges there, mm -hmm. but also people who have developmental disabilities, mm -hmm. who have mental health issues, yes. people who um, uh, people who are impoverished, mm -hmm. who don't have maybe the op opportunities to um, pay rent in the same ways in which you or my, you or I might. Right. Um, people who are homeless, mm -hmm. um, you know, survival sex mm -hmm. is a part of human trafficking, okay. and it happens quite a bit. If you mm -hmm. if you have nothing to eat, and someone says, "Hey, uh, if you do this for me, I'll get give give you some food, you know, money for food," right. you'll do it. Right. And so these are things that we should um, definitely. And then of course people that are faced with drug and alcohol addiction, Absolutely. which impairs your judgment and, um, you know, and, and their children, quite frankly. I mean, mm -hmm. we talked about this during the break. Mm -hmm. um, many people actually sell their own children. Right. And so being aware of that dynamic is really important. Absolutely. And and one of and, and I did bring that up to you because it was very heartbreaking. And when I knew about what was going on in this family, I was a mere child myself. I was a teenager. Yeah. So I didn't feel empowered to really do anything. But if someone hears about rumors of a parent who might might be pimping, exploiting their, child. exploiting their children. Yeah. Should somebody call the police? I mean, I would think that's the Absolutely. obvious thing Absolutely. to do is just call them and say, I think you really need to look into this. And, Absolutely. And just research it. Because what's the worst that could happen? That's right. And again, mm -hmm. National Human Trafficking Hotline has MOUs. They have agreements with all law enforcement okay. throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. So if you log a call like that with the hotline, mm -hmm. um, not only is the uh, uh, the local police department made aware and asked to respond to it, okay. but it's also logged federally. Okay, that's great. Okay, so we all can be empowered to do something and not just allow this to happen That's in right. our communities That's because again the numbers the, the statistics are absolutely heartbreaking and I just I'm, I'm kind of a numbers person because sometimes I think when you hear the numbers or you hear the statistics it kind of makes it a little bit more real and just know that you know these are people that have faces and these are people's children that are being exploited and taken advantage of right here in the United States mm -hmm. this is not happening in another community or, or in another country this is happening right here in the United States of America. And one statistic that I pulled, it said, um, according to some estimates, approximately 80% of trafficking involves sexual exploitation and 19% involves labor exploitation. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that. Yes. Right here in San Jose, that people are being exploited in terms of labor. So then um, another stat said there are approximately 20 to 30 million slaves in the world today, mm -hmm. right here in 2018. Yep. That many people, you don't think that. Um, according to the U.S. State Department, 600,000 to 800,000 people are trafficked across international borders every year, of which 80% are female and half are children. Yes. That's, you know, it, as that, a parent, it, that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. And one thing to note uh, on that is that um, while that's 800,000 that are trafficked into the into the U.S. Mm -hmm. potentially, um, I will tell you that, and, and, and other countries, mm -hmm. I will tell you that the majority of the people that are trafficked in the U.S. are U.S. citizens. Wow. So that I believe it's 78 percent are U.S. citizens. Awesome. That's just mind boggling. Mind boggling, it blows my mind that that could happen right here in 2018 in the United States. But you know what, this is our call to action. Um, we can all do something. First of all, we can be more aware of what's going on in our communities. If we see something, we need to say something. We need to speak up. We need to call the authorities. And you know, in closing, I would just like to say, um, we all have a call to action. 
even if it's just picking up the phone and reporting an, in, an incident if you see something that doesn't look right if this really tugs on your heart there's a need for beds yes so to open up a home where you can actually get victims off the street and put them in a bed so I just want to uh, first of all Thank you so Thank much you, for Terry. coming to talk to us. This has been great information that you shared. Um, it's been a little disheartening, but it's very encouraging knowing that there's people out there like you that are dedicated to this cause. So thank you thank from you. the bottom of my heart um, because I do know people that have been affected by this directly. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thanks, and I just want to thank everybody out there once again for um, tuning in to another episode of Real Talk with Terry. And again, I like to close on this positive note. Um, yesterday is history, tomorrow a mystery. Today is, the pr is a gift, which is why we call it the present. So remember, make this 24 hours count. And until next time, have a great day.